Hi everyone. Good morning. Happy Easter and praise the Lord for this wonderful day. For Christians, this has to be the most glorious day of all days. We were lost, but now we are found. Jesus sacrificed all to bring us eternal life and salvation. Well, today we're going to be reading, um, for those that are watching, we are broadcasting from Lord of the Harvest Christian Fellowship. Just want to shout out to all our friends, uh, especially those out of state, especially those out of the country. Thank you for um, supporting us in this ministry. Um, we're going to be looking at John chapter 20. And this is a story, really, of a woman. <laughs> We're going to look at her life, just a short glimpse at her life, and see how much maybe we're like her, or maybe we're not like her. We're going to see about the life of Mary. The Mary loved Jesus tremendously. You know, there's a saying, forgiven much, love much, and she was forgiven much. She just adored him, really adored him and worshipped him. And so on Friday, on Good Friday, which was the beginning of Passover when the sun went down, they were, um, the women were administering spices and herbs or whatever they do to preserve the body. And they wrap them in strips of linen and they sprinkle it with um, different spices. But the sun was going down, so they had to leave. They couldn't finish their job, basically, what it was. So Mary could not return until Sunday morning. And let's look what Mary did. It's pretty interesting to me. Um, and I just want to mention there's different versions of the resurrection. Rob went read one this morning. It's interesting to read them all and maybe squish them all together and you get the, the real story. But I think each author focused in on something different because they had a different purpose in writing this. So on John chapter uh, 20, verse 1, And now on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb early, while it was still dark. Now, can you imagine, especially a woman in this time, going to a cemetery when it's dark, alone? Now, it, it doesn't say she was with anybody at this point, but her, her love for him overcame the fear of the darkness. Can we say that about our own lives? Do our... Do our um, fears overtake us or do does our love overtake the fears um, many times when we are frightened our fear um, prevents us from doing things it prevents us from walking on the water it stops us but Mary wasn't afraid she she went she was determined to finish what she started um, so when she got there it says she saw that the t stone had been taken away from the tomb. Now, um, if you remember, I don't know, years ago, I spoke on the, the stone in the tomb. And the, the opening was maybe three and a half feet high. I don't know how wide. I don't remember how wide it is. Uh, so you really had to stoop down to get into the tomb. So she just saw that the, the stone was gone. She didn't really pursue it any further. And she ran. She ran to the disciples. She didn't even really know technically if Jesus was gone or not. So at this point, she's she's pretty shaken. She sees that the stone is rolled. The stone is extremely heavy. I don't even know how she thought she was going to move it to get in there. It's extremely heavy. And um, it's moved. And she's just all, she's, she's a mess. Someone's gone in there. They've stolen our Savior. She doesn't know for sure, but that's what she's thinking. Because many times our fears go wild. Our fears just take off. So she runs to the others. So then she ran and came to Simon Peter and to the other disciple whom Jesus loved, who is John. But John could represent us in all this. Let's just pretend that for a minute. And said to them, they have taken away the Lord out of the tomb and we do not where they have laid him. So sometimes our fears manifest they finish the story when it's not even the truth. It, it takes us to places where we're our ungodly. Our fears can run us. And you know what? Um, Mary was kind of doing this at this point. 
She's, she's imagining the worst. She has no belief right now. Her language of unbelief often reads things wrong. And so where she feels sorrow right now, she should be feeling joy because we know that Jesus said, after three days I will rise again. But she's not remembering that and she's just being fearful of that. And so then Peter went out and the other disciple and they were going to the tomb. And I love this. They were both running together. Peter's a little older, maybe a little chunkier, not sure. And John, younger, probably more fit. Uh, ran Peter, and he came to the tomb first, but he did not go in. I don't know if he was honoring age, age before beauty. I'm not sure what he was doing there, but he did not enter. And so, um, so they both ran together, and the other disciple outran Peter and came to the tomb first, and he, stooping down and looking in, saw the linen clothes lying there, yet he did not go in. Now, that in itself would tell you that robbers didn't take them because robbers either would have taken the whole body with the linens on or just shred, shredded the linens. But they were all as if Jesus just ascended out of those linens. And it's very well possible that's what he did. And let's keep reading. And then Simon Peter came following him and went into the tomb and he saw the linens lying there. And the handkerchief that had been around his head, not lying with the linen cloths, but folded together in a place by itself. So that said to Peter, you know, there's been no thievery here. There's been no theft here. So at this point, I don't know if any of them remember that Jesus said he would rise in three days. I don't know what's going through their mind. So then the other disciple who came to the tomb first went in also and he saw and believed. Now this is funny. Um, for as yet they did not know the scripture that he must rise again from the dead. Then the disciples went away to their own homes. You know, I was curious when it said, and he saw and believed. What did they believe? What did they believe at that point? They believe he was stolen? Did they believe he was his body ravished and torn and destroyed? It doesn't say what they believed. I would like to think they believed that he was alive, but I'm not so sure. So they left. They just went, they went back home. Not sure what they're feeling, not sure what they're saying, but they left. Now this is interesting to me, but Mary stood. But Mary stood. How many of us can say, when they're in, we're in the midst of a trial, when we're in the midst of heartache, when we're in the midst of fear, we stood. But Mary stood. That's powerful to me. It's so powerful. Is your love for Christ stronger than your fears? Will you be able to stand in your hour of fear? So let's keep reading. But Mary stood outside by the town tomb weeping and as she wept she stooped down and looked into the tomb now my bible is it looked in italics which means to emphasize it so here she is sobbing and have you ever seen a woman sob uncontrollably it's it's unbelievable and so as she wept she had to stoop down to get into that opening and she looked so despite the fact that she's sobbing and her eyes are full of tears she could see she looked so do we look to see if Jesus is there? See, she thought Jesus was gone. In the middle of this trial, she thought Jesus was gone. Okay, and then, you know, let's keep going. And then she saw, as she got in, she saw two angels in white sitting at one of, at the head and the other at the feet where the body of Jesus had lain. And that represents the Ark of the Covenant, the cherubim, the cherubim's were on either end, and that's a representation of the Holy of Holies. And it's interesting, isn't it? Who was the high priest? Who went in there? Mary, a woman. It's kind of interesting to me. Um, so then the angel said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? Now think about this for one minute. On Good Friday, on Good Friday, when, when our Lord gave up 
his spirit when he died and was separated from the Father. Probably first time ever. Separated from the Holy Spirit. First time ever. Separated from heaven. First time ever. What do you think heaven was like? I imagine it was silent. I imagine that there was no rejoicing. There was no singing. It was silent. But then on Sunday when he rose again, I imagine an explosion in heaven, singing and dancing. Can you just imagine all the creatures, all the angels? They were having a heavenly party. Jesus fulfilled the law. He saved the universe. He saved all mankind. And they were celebrating, celebrating. It's so awesome to me. So, you know, the angels, they're looking at her and they're saying, Why are you weeping? And she said, because they have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. She still hasn't um, got this. And then what happens? Now, when she had said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there and did not know that it was Jesus. How many times are we in the midst of a trial and we don't even see Jesus? We don't even know that he's with us. He's there. He's always there. Whether you feel him, whether you sense him, whatever, he's always there with you. He never leaves you, scripture says. He never leaves us. And I love this. He says, woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? Now notice Jesus repeated the same thing the angel said. Why are you weeping? I think he's giving them some credence. He's giving them some uh credit that they really are godly creatures and so he's repeating what they say and I think this is really interesting she is supposing him to be the gardener said to him sir if you have carried him away tell me where you have laid him and I will take him away that's pretty comical there's no way a gardener could carry dead weight and Jesus would have been a man dead heavy and then the question, well, how did he get the stone up? How was he going to carry this dead body? Where was he going to take it to? It's kind of comical to me that Mary wasn't even thinking how ridiculous this whole scenario was. There's no way this gardener could carry a body alone. And then he says to her, Mary, and she turned to him and said, Rabbi, which is to say teacher. The minute she heard him speak her voice, I mean, his, her name, she knew it was him. You know, and an interesting thing I read was um, she thought Jesus was the gardener. And maybe he is, and maybe we're the garden. Maybe he's who's tending us. Maybe we find him in beauty and flowers and, and, and maybe in the midst of all the heartache, he brings us flowers. He brings us joy. He brings us something beyond what we could ever imagine. So here is Mary. And you think Mary is so excited now? And she wants to touch him, but he says, Do not cling to me, for I have not yet ascended to my father, but go to my brethren and say to them, Notice he says, Go to my brethren. Can we say that? They totally denied him. They totally left him. They, they had no part of him when he was uh, being crucified. But he forgives them. He forgives them. He says, go to my brethren. He loves them. Can we do that? Go to my brethren and say to them, I am an ascending to my father and your father and to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene came and told the disciples that she had seen the Lord and that he had spoken these things to her. Then the same day at evening, Being the first day of the week, when the doors were shut, where the disciples were assembled, for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood in the midst and said to them, Peace be with you. And when he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side, and then the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. And so Jesus said to them again, Peace to you. As the Father in heaven, as the Father has sent me, I also send you. And when he had said this, 
he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit, being sent out as new creatures. See, Jesus created a whole new creation. What was old is gone. He's created something so new. You know, the old garden is gone. The new garden is uh, alive. And he's the gardener. So he's saying, um, I lost my place. They are forgiven. And if you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven. Then if you retain the sins of any, they are retained. I'm going to stop there. Jesus sends us out as new creations. He sends us out as an answer to his promise that he would rise again. You know, I was thinking today, it's so funny that we celebrate Christmas. We celebrate so many things with hugeness. But today, um, it's sort of lower on the, the rating scale. It's, but yet it's so important. We wouldn't be sitting here. We wouldn't be, we wouldn't be praising God if he hadn't saved us. If he wouldn't have died on that cross. And you know, I, I know some of you are at my age and it saddens me to think about how Easter, Good Friday and Easter is viewed nowadays on Good Friday. And some of you that are my age would remember that. We, um, we couldn't go out. Stores and banks, everything was closed from 12 to 3. And I remember I wasn't allowed to watch television, not that it was that big of a deal back then, but we had to respect the event that took place. Nowadays, I'm not sure I'm seeing that anymore. And I see people clamoring at stores, people clamoring to buy goodies. And But are we really clamoring <laughs> to praise God, to worship Him? I think Mary was amazing. As, as, a, as afraid she was of the dark, there was light at the end of the story for her. We have to remember that if we're in darkness, there will always be light. There will always be light. So I know that many of you are going through difficult times right now. Be like Mary. Push through the darkness. Push through the darkness and seek his face. Push through the darkness and know that he is always there. You might not recognize him at first. Maybe you don't recognize him until he calls your name. But when you hear his voice, you will be calm. When you hear his voice, you will know all is well with your soul. So, Lord, time for communion. Lord, I just want to thank you so much for um, being remarkable doing all that you did while you were alive, doing all that you did on the cross, doing all that you did after you rose from the dead, ministered to your people, loved your people. Lord, thank you so much that you always are a God of second chances, that you always, always love us, no matter how dumb we might be sometimes. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. We thank you for your blood. In Jesus' name. Remember, when Jesus was in the garden of Gethsemane, it was hard for him. He, he, he really got worried <laughs> that he wasn't able to go through this. And an angel came and ministered to him. It's okay. It's okay to say to God, I'm worried. I don't know if I can do this. He will, he will help you. He will help you along the way, whatever it is you're struggling with. But the key is to turn to him, to ask him for help, to know that he'll walk with you. Today is magnificent. It's his resurrection day. It's the day we shout, he is risen, he is risen. Hallelujah, he is risen. And it's all because he was willing to sacrifice all for us. Willing. Are we willing to sacrifice all for him? Are we willing to look at the trials that come our way and not view them at first like Mary did? Oh, he's stolen. But to really to look at the trial and tribulation as if it's ordained by God. God's going to walk me through this. 
So we thank, we thank Jesus for his blood. We thank you for that Good Friday that brought us to this wonderful Sunday. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. May we do what you asked us to do. May we be fishers of men. May we be people that go out and minister the word, Lord. The Great Commission, dear Jesus. That's what you've asked us to do. And it's the least we can do after your, your huge sacrifice on the cross. Thank you for your blood, Jesus. Amen. Well, I know I'm supposed to announce Sunday school, online Sunday school. I'm getting better. Um, so if your children are there and they know what to do, if your children are you're new today and you want them to go, it's um, www.lchflhcl.com slash online Sunday school. I think um, Andrew is pretty good about putting it up there for you to see it. Um, but the teachers are doing a great, great, incredible job. And I just want to thank a shout out to them. Thank them so much for administering to our little ones, to giving them, showing them the way. Thank you guys so much. So have a wonderful Easter. Remember him all day. Remember our mighty Savior who died and rose again. Amen. Good morning. Well, we uh, taught on Friday at the Good Friday service about the death of Christ. And uh, if you didn't get a chance to see that, that'll be put on our site. And you can look at it. Today we will look at the resurrection. On Sunday mornings, um, I get my first uh, ding for a text on my cell phone from one of my pastor groups that I'm involved with and a scripture comes out on Sunday morning and this Sunday morning 1 Corinthians 15 was the text in that grouping and then at 7.30 I go uh, on the site for a national call for prayer and the pastor who prayed this morning, uh, our, our beloved friend from Queens, New York City, Pastor Wilson Chimeris went on and he prayed 1 Corinthians 15 for the morning. So I'm going to look at several scriptures <clears throat> and I want to start out with 1 Corinthians 15 as we look to the resurrection. 1 Corinthians 15, 1 starts like this. Moreover, brethren, I declare to you the gospel which I preach to you, which also you received and in which you stand. Paul preaches or proclaims, we receive and then we all stand together in that gospel. By which also you are saved if you hold fast that word which I preach to you, unless you believed in vain. And we hang on to it. And we continue to believe in it. For I delivered to you, first of all, that which I also received, that the Messiah died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. And he declares, a, it's, a, it's a mini creedal statement there, and actually uh, perhaps one of the earliest New Testament creeds. He declares it there, and then he goes in from uh, Christ died, Christ was buried, Christ rose, and then to Christ appeared, which is what Pastor Jan shared today uh, out of John 20. And Rob shared it earlier out of Luke 24. And we also see it in Matthew 28 and Mark 16. But this appearance actually then sets in motion 
the commissioning of two apostolic ministries. It is seeing the resurrected Lord and being commissioned by him that leads to both post-resurrection and post-ascension apostolic ministries. And he appeared, and Paul begins to list the tradition of those to whom the Lord appeared as raised from the dead. These are not fantasies. These are not fables. These are eyewitness testimony. First of all, it says he was seen by Cephas, Peter, first, then by the twelve, and after that he was seen by over 500 brethren at once, of whom the greater part remain to the present, but some have fallen asleep. After that he was seen by James, then by all the the apostles, all the rest of the apostles, Then last of all, he was seen by me also as one born out of due time. For I am the least of the apostles who am not worthy to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. While the others were following him, I was persecuting. So Paul places his apostolic commissioning at the end of this initial list here. He says, however, by the grace of God, I am what I am. Grace is the basis of the apostolic call, just as grace is the basis of our salvation, just as grace is the basis of our life in Christ. But by the grace of God, I am what I am, and his grace toward me was not in vain, but I labored more abundantly than they all. Yet not I, but the grace of God which is with me. Paul becomes a a toiler, uh, one who uh, is involved in the labor of the gospel, and he attributes it to God's grace and God's grace alone. Therefore, whether it was I or they, so we preach and so you believed. Now, if Messiah is preached that he has been raised from the dead, how do some among you say there is no resurrection of the dead? But if there is no resurrection of the dead, then the Messiah is not risen. And if the Messiah is not risen, then our preaching is empty and your faith is also empty. Yes, and we are found false witnesses of God because we have testified of God that he raised up Messiah whom he did not raise up, if in fact the dead do not live, or the dead do not rise. For if the dead do not rise, then Messiah is not risen, and if Messiah is not risen, your faith is futile, you are still in your sins. Then also those who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished, those who have died, they've perished as well. If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men the most pitiable. Now, the prophetic significance of the resurrection is that we have great hope in this life, and the purpose of the resurrection is not simply to save us after death. In fact, it's to make us part of the eschatological purposes of the Lord, the establishing of his kingdom in human history. However, If that were our only hope, Paul says, we would be pitied. We have a hope that extends beyond this life. And this idea of labor, the the term that Paul uses for laboring as an apostle, he'll use it in in the passage in Colossians that we're going to go to. Um, This idea of laboring, it's a picture of manual labor. And you know, everybody has to work. Manual labor means we work so many hours a day. We we work to fulfill purpose. We work to be obedient to God. We work to provide for our families. But when the work is finished, the work is not the ultimate goal. When the work is over, we go home to be with our family, to celebrate, to rest, to relax, to be reinvigorated for the next day. 
And what Paul is saying is, is we have great purpose in our lives, great purpose in Christians, in being Christians, in being disciples, in being part of God's kingdom purposes in the earth, but that's our manual labor. In the end, we go home to celebrate with our family, to rest, to rejoice, to be rejuvenated. And that, of course, is the picture of after death, we have an eternal rest, an eternal Sabbath, an eternal celebration in his presence. Our labor will have been finished. But now Christ is risen from the dead and has become the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. Second reference that I want to look at to the resurrection, I want to go back to the Gospel of John, where Jan ended. Not in chapter 20, but I want to go to chapter 5. And I want you to see two aspects of the resurrection. There is both a future implication to the resurrection. We will die and be raised as Jesus died and was raised. Death will not have the final say in our lives. But there is also a present implication to resurrection that God raises us up now spiritually and empowers us to perform the Father's work in the earth. John 5, and again, this is a passage we've been quoting regularly these past weeks. It's a picture of apostolic, prophetic ministry, fivefold ministry, discipleship. John 5.20, for the Father loves, uh, excuse me, 5.19, let's start there. Then Jesus answered and said to his disciples, Most assuredly, I say unto you, the Son can do nothing of himself but what he sees the Father do. For whatever he does, whatever the Father does, the Son also does in like manner. So there's this imaging in the Father-Son relationship, which extends to us because we are sons and daughters of God. We look to the Father and we image what he is doing. What the Father does sets in motion our life purpose, our goals, our objectives, our manual labor, our apostolic work, our discipleship. For the Father loves the Son and shows him all things that he himself does, and he will show him greater works than these that you may marvel. Now, I mean, this is Jesus who's, who's you know, you know, turning water into wine. This is Jesus who's raising the dead and healing the sick. This is Jesus who's multiplying loaves and fish miraculously. This is Jesus who's walking on the waters. And Jesus says, the Father is showing Jesus these things, and that's why Jesus is doing these things and is able to do these things. But there's going to be something greater. And the greatest act Jesus is going to describe in a moment. For as the Father raises the dead and gives life to them, even so the Son gives life to whomever he will. For the Father judges no one, but has committed all judgment to the Son, that all should honor the Son just as they honor the Father. He who does not honor the Son does not honor the Father who sent him. The greater work is going to be the resurrection from the dead. And we don't mean raising the dead as Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead or the, um, the, um, the nobleman's daughter or, or other others that Jesus raised up. Because, you know, Lazarus was raised from the dead, lived for a while and died again. This resurrection is the resurrection, the greater work, the work whereby one will be raised from the dead and live forevermore. See, this is the greatest work of the Father and the Son. This is the greatest work the Father performs and the Son sees and will perform himself. Keep that in mind. No greater miracle than that. Oh, I, I, just, I, I just wish we'd see miracles in our day and age. I wish we'd see signs and wonders. Well, amen. Let it be so, Lord. The greatest miracle you're going to see, though, will be when you close your eyes in death and you're awakened in eternity to be with the Lord and be with his people. 
Jesus says in verse 24, Most assuredly, I say unto you, he who hears my word and believes in him who sent me has, present tense, not will one day, but has everlasting life now and shall not come into judgment, but has passed from death into life. See, eternal life is something we possess now when we hear the word of the Lord and believe that word. When we hear Jesus' word and believe that the Father sent Jesus. We have eternal life. We enter into eternal life now. So there's a kind of proleptic experience of the ultimate resurrection from the dead when your the scales fall from your eyes, your ears are dug out, and God gives you a new heart a heart of flesh for a heart of stone, and the Lord gives you new life, and you see Jesus as Lord. So, by proleptic, it means this, the explosive power of Jesus' resurrection from the dead is planted into the lives of men and women who are alive when they hear it, when they receive it, but literally are projected into an eternal life that will never end from the moment they hear and receive and respond to that word in faith. So there is a prophetic dimension. Eternal life begins when we die and are raised from the dead and live with him forever, but eternal life, the seed of it, is planted in us so that we could say there's a spiritual dimension to resurrection that has already begun in the life of every believer who believes in Jesus. He has eternal life and shall not come into judgment, but has passed from death into life. And the, the, the nature of eternal life is that you've already been pardoned and given eternal access into the supranatural, the cosmic reality of eternal life. Most assuredly, I say unto you, the hour is coming and now is. We're going to look at Paul in Colossians 1. We're going to go there next and watch the term now. Paul already used it in 1 Corinthians 15. Now. Watch the term now. It's not one day or tomorrow. It's now. And it's now because we are in Christ when we hear his word and believe in the one who sent him. We are already in Christ, which means the reality that Christ now inhabits, a human being, a God-man, but a human being who died and was raised from the dead and lives forevermore, and we are already in it. We have, in essence, been judged. Well, one day I'm going to stand before the judgment seat of Christ, you are. And at that point, I'll be, that's where real, real justification takes place when before the throne of God, after I've died, Jesus says, you're in. Yes and no. We've already experienced it proleptically. It means something that's future, we're experiencing now before the future before the future actually takes place for us. See, the future's already taken place for the Lord. He's raised, he's ascended, he sits at the right hand of the Father, and he has pardoned us, brethren. And every time you step into Christ in faith, you walk in the reality of one who has been pardoned, not one who is waiting to be pardoned. Now, we, we, we get distracted and we struggle and with unbelief and we sin and we fall and we fail and we forget for a moment, but Jesus says we have eternal life right now. We are possessors of it. I say unto you, the hour is coming and now is when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God and those who hear will live. Hearing the voice of the Son of God, Mary, which is what he said, and she turns and she says, Rabboni, my teacher, my Lord, my master. We've heard the voice of the Son of God speak and we have turned and we've been made alive in Christ. 
For as the Father has life in himself, so has he granted the Son to have life in himself, and he has given him authority to execute judgment also because he is the Son of Man. Do not marvel at this, for an hour is coming in which all who are in the graves will hear his voice. There's those who hear him now and experience a spiritual resurrection, and those who hear him now and experience the spiritual resurrection will experience a future resurrection. So the resurrection itself is is divided into a current spiritual resurrection that proleptically foreshadows an ultimate physical resurrection. All right, let's take that that information and look at a final passage. Colossians 1. Colossians 1 would be um, then um, the title uh, of our message today, The Prophetic Significance of the Resurrection. Got to include this message in our prophetic nature of the church message because it's very prophetic. It's declaring the purposes of the Lord in the earth. We'll read through this somewhat quickly and 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 hopefully uh, as we uh, work through this somewhat quickly, there'll be certain portions we might pause and spend a little more time in. Paul, an apostle, Colossians 1.1. 1, 1. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God. Very important. He's an apostle because of the will. And because he's an apostle by the will of God, his apostolic ministry will bring the church of Jesus Christ into the will of God. When we do things in the will of God, we can impart grace for others to enter into the will of God. That's the danger of false teaching and false prophecy. False teaching and false prophecy is not the will of God. And what that imparts to people is falsehood. It it imparts fantasy instead of truth. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God, and Timothy, our brother. Paul always includes those who are part of his apostolic team. He, he, it's everything's about team. Hey, what's the difference between Old Covenant and New Covenant? Well, the purpose of the Old Covenant was team. At Exodus 19, when the children of Israel came to the mountain, the Lord said, I want you to be a kingdom of priests. I want all of you to be priests. But we, we, we leave Sinai. We come to Sinai with the purposes of God, the eternal purposes of God. We leave Sinai with the provisional purposes of God. Well, the tribe of Levi is going to be the priest because we only see faithfulness in the tribe of Levi. But the the new covenant is all about the restoration of the original promises of Exodus 19. You shall be a kingdom of priests unto our God. In fact, a a kingdom of priests and kings unto our God depending on the text you read. So, New Covenant is all about the reinstitution of the original purposes of God. It's a it's covenant renewal. The original purposes of the Lord is team. So, Paul is always involved with team. At the start of the letter, it's Paul and this, that, and the other brother or sister. And at the end of the letter, it's greeting this brother and this sister and this disciple and this co-worker and this co-laborer and this member of the apostolic team. We come into the full purposes of God as a team. Something that has just struck me and is striking me powerfully recently. Lord of the Harvest is going to become what God has called Lord of the Harvest to become as a team. We're not going to, it's not going to be as a group of individuals or a remnant or Pastor Oz and a couple other five-fold leaders or, or this group of faithful brothers and sisters. Lord of the Harvest is going to enter in as a team. As Ephesians 4 says, when it speaks of maturity, the maturity of the body of Christ, every part doing its share. We had a great challenge last night in terms of intercessory prayer. We had a great challenge this morning and we are still in the midst of great challenges as a church. Individuals suffering unimaginably, unimaginably 
demonic manifestations of oppression and suffering. And last night it just struck me. We're not getting out of this just because Pastor Oz is praying. We're not getting out of this just because Pastor Oz and Jan and Pastor Philip are praying or Pastor Oz and Pastor Jan and Pastor Philip and Pastor Andrea and Pastor Rob. We're not just getting out of this because a couple of us who are leaders are praying. Not even just we're going to add the intercessors. We're going to get out of this because the church is praying. And the church, the church's prayer is going to tip the bowls of incense and pour out apostolic anointing at Lord of the Harvest, at Living the Word Christian Ministries, at Trinity Chapel, at at, at Grace Christian Fellowship, at, at churches all around Metro Detroit Christian. The church praying together is going to bring the church into its apostolic reality and destiny. Now, Paul and Timothy, the apostolic team, write to the saints and the faithful brethren in Christ who are in Colossae. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. As apostolic leaders, they represent the grace of God the Father and his Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. They are not the sources of the grace. They they are the stewards of the grace. They care for what belongs to another. And it's the grace, the steadfast love, and the peace, the shalom of the Lord to the saints and faithful brethren, the faithfulness of the Lord that creates the chesed ones, the saints, the ones who are baptized and, and, and immersed in his grace. And what does it produce? Thanksgiving. I mean, you go from a year in the Psalms, we go back to the New Testament, we're going to see the same themes running back and forth. No, it's not New Testament theology, Old Testament theology. It's biblical theology. We give thanks to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ as we pray for you always. Paul gives thanks. He gives thanks because The grace and the peace of the Lord is effective in his life. Remember, he talked about the reason I'm an apostle, the reason I can labor is because God's grace is in me, which we read in 1 Corinthians 15 at the start of the message. That grace and then the access to shalom, to the blessings of the Lord. See, when Jesus says you have eternal life and you've passed from judgment unto life, To pass from judgment on the life means I now have access to the shalom, all the blessings that God intended in the original creation of the earth that, of course, was uh, momentarily lost, momentarily set aside by the sin of man, a blip. on God's cosmic perspective, a blip in terms of God's cosmic outplaying of his purposes in human history, a very deadly blip, we might add, but a blip in compared to what Jesus has accomplished. And grace is right there. And remember what Paul has already said in Romans, where sin abounds, blip, grace superabounds, wider, deeper, longer, higher, more powerful. And Paul says, we give thanks and we pray. This is, you know, when the, when, when the disciples in Acts chapter 6 says, we're going to commit the, um, the food ministry to ministers, but we, the apostles, are going to be involved in the ministry of the word and prayer. This is what apostles do. They thank God for God's people and they pray for God's people as well as staying in the word of the Lord. And he says, we do this since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus. Now, we want to emphasize this term in Christ. We're going to see in Christ, 
over and over and over again in this Colossians passage. I mean, we, we could, I don't know that we're going to get to the end of this chapter, but if we were to get to the end, you're going to see in Christ, in Christ, in Christ. You will also see things like with Christ and through Christ and for Christ. But the predominant phase is in Christ, and this is the real prophetic significance of the resurrection. Jesus is a circle. I always teach this to my church. This is a picture I try to literally engrave in people's hearts and minds. In Christ is a circle. Christ is in that circle, and everything that Christ has done, everything that Christ has accomplished, all that Christ is, Christ's relationship with the Father through the Spirit is within that circle. That's the reality of the Godhead. It's the reality within which Jesus exists. Not you and I, but Jesus, the Father, and the Spirit exist in this. And it's now not just something that is taking place in heaven. The Son has come to earth. The greatest event in human history has taken place. God has become man in Christ's life, his death, his resurrection, his ascension back to heaven to be established as king in the universe. But now, what was true in heaven before the life of Jesus is now true in human history. Jesus has come into human history. He's invaded human history. So the the realm in Christ has extended from heaven to earth now. Earth is included. Human experience, human existence, human history is included in Christ if we but hear the word that he speaks, Jesus, and believe it. We step into the circle, and now everything that is true about the Father, the Son, and the Spirit is true about us as long as we are in Christ. That's important. It's important to understand this. Being in Christ means Christ possesses the grace. Christ possesses the peace. Christ possesses the righteousness. Christ possesses the eternal life. Christ possesses the faith, hope, and love. I don't. I don't possess any of those things. He possesses them, and when I step into the circle in Christ, I partake in divine realities. And so this idea of in Christ, it's going to be emphasized. If that's all I do is just go through this, uh, go, go through this, passage and point out to you all the in Christ references. Since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and your love for all the saints. Now the the faith is in Christ, the love is for the saints. That's interesting. I mean, we, 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 we understand we love God with all our heart, soul, and strength, but we are to love our neighbor as ourselves. We're to love the saints. And at this point, it's gonna it will be expanded. The the, the love um, uh, will will be spoken of um, in verse 8 this way, that Epaphras, the apostolic figure that planted the church in Colossae, declared to Paul in verse 8, your love in the Spirit. We have faith in Christ. It's Christ's faith. He was faithful, and by God's grace and peace working upon us, we respond to him, we believe, because of his faithfulness. And the love that we demonstrate toward the saints is because of the Spirit. The Spirit then, the Spirit. Uh, Augustine said that the Father is the lover. The Son is the one who is loved by the Father, who's the lover, and the Holy Spirit is the love between them. So to say that the love is the love of the Spirit, even when we love each other, when we love the saints, it's because we're in Christ and we're being empowered by the divine reality that is between the Father and Son through the Spirit, and then that love flows through us to the saints. And by the way, that love, that flows through us is not just warm, fuzzy feelings. It manifests itself in tangible actions of kindness toward others. 
It manifests itself in healing. It manifests itself in encouragement. It manifests itself in prophetic words. It manifests itself in setting people free from the power of the devil. But that love flows from the Spirit. We experience that love as we stand in Christ. Lord, we want to see people healed. Get in Christ and let the love that is between the Father and the Son flow through you. In Christ, through Christ. We're going to see ultimately it's also for Christ that we do these things. Now, we've got faith and love in verse 4, but we've got to get hope in there. The, the big three, okay? There was a big three before Detroit became the, the auto center of the United States. And that, of course, my wife talked about when we were kids. That's the reality back when we were kids. But there was a big three, faith, hope, and love. Now, here's something that's so important to understand here. Since we heard of your faith in Christ and of your love for all the saints, but verse 8 says that love is in the Spirit, in the Holy Spirit, and then it says because of the hope. Faith and love proceed from hope. Where we start as Christians, hope. Hope gives birth. I mean, you can read different translations um, that the hope is the source of the faith and love. The hope in verse 5 is the source of the faith and love in verse 4. The hope, uh, the faith and love in verse 4 proceeds from the hope or is on account of the hope or because of the hope in verse 5. And we want to define hope clearly, which is laid up for you in heaven. See, it's a heavenly reality. It Hope is in heaven, not on the earth, in me. It's in heaven, but it's in Jesus who brought it to earth. The God-man, he's the, the ladder between heaven and earth that connects the two. The hope which is laid up for you in heaven, which you heard before in the word of the truth of the gospel. We need steadfast love and faithfulness steadfast love and faithfulness, the two major characteristics of God, Yahweh in the Old Testament, steadfast love, faithfulness. Faithfulness is amit in Hebrew, and what is faithful is faithful because it's true. So grace and truth is steadfast love and faithfulness in the Old Testament, and we had to get it in here. We've got the grace and the peace from God the Father in verse 2, and now we've got the truth. We've got steadfast love, faithfulness, shalom of the Lord. See, the gospel is the source for our faith and our love. The gospel is a depository of truth. And as we respond to the truth of the written word and the proclaimed word, because remember, The resurrection, the reason you and I believe in the resurrection isn't that Jesus appeared necessarily to us the way he did to the original apostles. Now, some people have had Jesus appear to them and we we say, amen, that's apostolic. But the majority of believers who have believed in Christ were because somebody to whom Jesus appeared bore witness and said, With my eyes, I saw it. With my ears, I saw it. With my hands, I handled the word of life, the Lord Jesus. And I share this with you that you may have fellowship with us and fellowship with the Lord. We are here because there was an objective proclamation of the truth, not because Jesus appeared to us. Now, because of that objective proclamation of the truth, Christ is formed in our hearts. We hear him, we see him in our hearts. But see, hope is resident in the truth of the proclaimed gospel slash written word. That's where hope starts. And that hope 
contributes to our faith and love. And hope here is tied in with the truth of the gospel. See, hope and truth go together. Truth is what formulates faith within us. Truth is what formulates the release of love within us. Truth that comes from the hope of the gospel. The hope of the gospel is simply this. And Paul's going to mention hope uh, several more times in this passage. The hope of the gospel has to do with the fact that truth is declared to us. The hope of the gospel says God promises to do this and God promises to do that. This is what hope is. It's that I expect God to be faithful to the things that he has promised. And see, that's the birth of faith and love. I'm struggling with my faith. I'm struggling with my love, Pastor. You're struggling with truth is what you are. Read scripture and live as if it's true because the God who promises is faithful to fulfill it. And you see how the resurrection fits into this whole eschatological scheme. The resurrection is the ultimate promise of God. Most promises of God you can see fulfilled in your own human lifetime. In, in your experiences. But there's one you cannot see fulfilled in this lifetime, and that is the promise of resurrection from the dead. So resurrection is central to the hope in the gospel. It's the ultimate truth. That's why Paul said, if you don't, he, he's saying, he's saying, if, if Christ isn't raised from the dead, forget it. It's all over. But he said earlier, the truth of the gospel which if you believe it, you will be saved. The ultimate issue is believe in the faithful promises of God. Whether you see him or not, he said it, we believe it. Verse 6, and this gospel has come to you as it has also in all the world, and it's bringing forth fruit as it also has among you, since the day you heard and knew the grace of God and truth. See, the gospel produces faithfulness. The gospel produces faithfulness because the gospel releases grace and truth and it reveals who God is, the Father, the Son, and the Spirit, and then invites you to come in Christ and participate in the relationship that the Father, Son, and the Spirit have with each other. As you also learn from Epaphras, our dear fellow servant, who is a faithful minister of Christ on your behalf. Now, Epaphras was the apostle who founded. Uh, Epaphras was the uh, apostle who founded the Colossian church. Paul didn't. But Paul, Epaphras was part of Paul's apostolic team that he sent out from Ephesus and that he sent out from Corinth and that he sent out from other apostolic centers that he set up and this church was established. Now, it, it says he is our, our fellow servant who is also a faithful servant of Christ on your behalf. The, the servant language, remember in the Psalms, David goes from being the king, the great mighty king of the Jewish people to becoming one who is poor and needy to simply becoming at the end of the Psalter, the final Psalms, he's the servant of the Lord. The key figure in Isaiah chapters 40 through 66, which we're starting to read right now, particularly 40 through 55, is the servant of the Lord. See, see, biblical authority is not about being a president or being a CEO in spite of what you hear a lot of people teach, no, the apostle's like a CEO. No, he's not. He's a servant. He might start off in his own mind, which is, you know, in his own head, which is about 10 sizes too big. That's okay. The Lord will cut him down and humble him and bring him into real apostolic authority. A servant. Jesus said the Son of Man did not come to be served. That's what CEOs and presidents do did not come to be served, but to serve others and to give his life as a ransom for the many. And you, you have to understand, the, the, the minister, the apostle, the fivefold 
leader is a servant, ultimately. It's interesting, the word for servant and the word for minister, it's the same word in the New Testament. So you could look at someone and say, well, he's a five-fold minister, but you could also say he's a five-fold servant, and servant is the real translation of it. Epiphras is a faithful servant of Christ for you on your behalf, who also declared to us your love in the Spirit. For this reason, we also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you and to ask that you may be filled. And that this, this, this idea of being filled is going to pervade this chapter. Being filled. We are empty containers and the Lord pours his life, his reality in us through the power of the Spirit to see the Father and to enter into a relationship with the Father and to be loved by the Father as he loves the Son. We're going to see this idea of filling. For this reason, we also, since the day we heard of it, do not cease to pray for you. And in our prayers, we ask that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding. The apostle prays. The pastor prays. The leaders of a church pray. We pray. And what do we pray? We pray for impartation. We pray for impartation. And as we pray, as we enter, this is, this is the picture of servant leadership in the church. You go before the Lord and you get what you need for your life. You get what you need to lead. You get what you need to live a life worthy of the gospel. And then out of the basis of what God fills you up with, you impart that to others that they too may be servants of the Lord. Now, this is what Paul is praying for, to be filled with revelation knowledge of his will. I'm going to look at the Greek here a little bit. He's praying for revelation knowledge of his will. Remember, Paul is an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God in verse 1. Well, he's in the will of God, and he wants to pray for the saints to be in the will of God as well. We pray for revelation of his will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding. Spiritual wisdom, spiritual understanding. Spiritual understanding is this. Spiritual revelation is the knowledge of his will. Spiritual understanding teaches us why God's will is God's will. And spiritual wisdom then teaches us how to put it into practice, put it into being, put it into reality. And the first thing that the apostle prays for this church is the will of God. At Lord of the Harvest, it's the word, the word, the word, but it's just, it's not the word for, you know, how can I, I meet my needs? You know, how, how can life turn out good for me? It's not like a kind of a self-help therapeutic seminar. That's not what the word of God is about. That's not what ministry is about. That's not what the church is about. What the church is, is about revelation of the will of the Father. And the purpose for this prayer of revelation and spiritual understanding and wisdom is that you should walk worthily of the Lord to please him in all respects, in every good work bearing fruit and increasing in the full revelation knowledge of who God is. That's, that's the implication of the Greek here. So we get this wisdom and spiritual understanding to walk, to walk, to live a life that is worthy to please the Lord. Now, if I start talking about the purpose of church in the mind of many Christians is to have their needs met, I'm, I'd be finished. I'll be done. I'll go off on a rabbit trail. It's not. Again, the church has been molded into the shape of the culture and the world. The culture and the world is driven by promises on how to your life to live out happily ever after. That is not the gospel. That's nowhere. It's not in Paul. It's not in Jesus. It's nowhere in the New Testament. It's not there. 
the purpose of church, an authentic apostolic church functioning the way the church is supposed to function is to give us spiritual wisdom, understanding, and revelation to live lives that please the Lord and therefore are worthy of what it means to be a disciple of Jesus and help carry out his kingdom purposes in human history. And when that revelation is done and that teaching that leads to that revelation is done, Christians bear fruit and increase in the full revelatory knowledge of who God is and what his purposes are. Now, let me say this. That's not ignoring the fact that personal, individual issues in our lives are not important. Of course they're important. But everything that comes in our lives, every trial, every tribulation, every difficulty is a stepping stone to enter into the fullness of what God has planned for your life. And what God has planned for your life is to make you part of that kingdom of priests. And the priests taught the people of God how to worship the Lord and how to walk in covenant faithfulness to him. See, when when life becomes um, like set up around goals that I attain for my own personal happiness, wow, we live in a world that opposes personal happiness from every front. And it's not just the world, it's the demonic powers and principalities behind it. The demonic powers and principalities are driven by what? Self-preservation. And so the pressures that we feel towards self-preservation don't come from Jesus. They come from the demonic realm. As real as those are and as legitimate as they are. But see, when your perspective changes, and this is what the renewing of the mind is, this is the prophetic significance of the resurrection, that we now possess eternal life and we're moved in Christ. We, we, we step out from outside of the circle into the circle and we're in Christ. When we, our minds are renewed and we begin to understand everything in life, is a stepping stone toward equipping me to help fulfill the eschatological purposes of God in human history. He's making me part of that plan. See, life takes on a different picture. Oh, okay. My horrible, terrible upbringing, my, my, my fears, my illnesses, my difficulties, my struggles with my relationships, my struggles with uh, who's going to be president and, and, and which political party is of God. They're simply vehicles the Lord uses to reveal who he is, to get us to step out from being outside of Christ to step into the circle and being in Christ and living a fully empowered life. Where's the power, Lord? It's there, it's in Christ. But you're running around outside of Christ wanting this, that, and the other thing to be fixed in your life. Step in. Be empowered for the signs, the wonders, the, 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 the prophecy, the anointing, the grace, the kindness, the victory that's needed for you to establish God's kingdom purposes in the earth. And guess what? All the other things get taken care of too. In fact, the other things become secondary. All right, now, verse 11. We are empowered with all power according to the might of his glory for all perseverance and long-suffering with joy. This revelation of who God is that we ended verse 10 with, this full explosive revelation of who God is, Father, Son, and Spirit, empowers us with all power according to the might of his glory. See, when we see who he is, we see him in his glory and his glory transforms us. And it transforms us so that we persevere and we suffer with joy. 
Persevere means we press through whatever difficulty we're in because we understand it's just a stepping stone to become part of the establishment of his kingdom purposes in the earth. And we have not just, we don't just suffer with joy, long suffering. Suffering then becomes not a a tool that's fighting against us, but a tool that we move with to become like Jesus. Again, telling you the person who's lifting weight, I mean, muscle tissues are being torn as you're lifting those weights. That's suffering, but that makes you stronger. They're being torn and they're being replenished even stronger even stronger than they were before you lifted the weight. When you're dying, you're killing yourself, running on the treadmill, you're out of breath, it's strengthening your lungs. You see, that's what long suffering is. You you realize, okay, I'm going through this for a reason. The Lord is making me stronger for his purposes. And giving thanks to the Father. See, this is how we, we walk worthy of the Lord. We bear fruit. We increase in revelation knowledge of him. We're empowered according to his glorious might and we give thanks. See, that's that's what it means to walk worthy of the Lord. Just, just doing the things that come supernaturally natural through the work of the Holy Spirit when we are in Christ. Giving thanks to the Father who has qualified us. He has made us strong. He has equipped us to share in the inheritance that the saints of God possess when they walk in his light. See, he's qualifying us, light. See, everything I'm sharing here, it's light. I'm just sharing from the scripture to enlighten your mind, to transform your mind, to renew your mind, to get you to begin to see things from the perspective of in Christ. You can stand outside of Christ, even as a Christian, stand outside and let the world give you an understanding of what's going on, or you can step in Christ and see out from being in Christ things the way they are. Okay, here's what I want to say. And I've heard leaders and say, well, there's a lot of prophecy going on right now. I'm just sitting back and waiting to see which, which of the prophets are correct. Well, did you ever hear of of, of of apostolic discernment? Did you ever hear of prophetic discernment? I don't have to sit back and wait. If I am walking in the light as he is in the light, I'm going to have discernment because he's qualified us to share in the inheritance that belongs to the chesed ones, the saints, the holy ones, the ones who are immersed in his steadfast love and faithfulness in the light. Now, we begin to have a series of who statements at this point. These these series of who did this and who did that and who did this. Right here it says who, and it's, it's, it's going back again to the Father, The Father is in the context here. It's the revelation of the Father. We're going to see the revelation of the Son in a moment, but this is the revelation of the Father. Who, this is the Father, the one who qualified us for our inheritance. He is the one who rescued us from the dominion of darkness and transferred us into the kingdom of the Son of his love. See, there's, that's what it means to, to receive our inheritance in light, to see that God the Father took us out of, he rescued us from the dominion of darkness. That's being outside of Christ, and he transferred us into Christ, into the kingdom of the Son of his love. It's his beloved Son, into the kingdom of his beloved Son. Remember, being in Christ, it's the Father's the lover, the Son is the one who's loved The Spirit is the love between them, the uniting bond of love between them. Well, now the Father has put us right in the middle of that Father-Son loving experience in the power of the Spirit and says, I'm including all of you in Christ. And the same love that I have for the Son and the Son has for me, 
and the spirit is the flow of love between us, I'm putting you in it and you can experience all of that. My love for you, your love for me, the son's work in you. And again, this is, Jesus said, we have eternal life. We're not waiting for this to happen. Paul is celebrating to the Colossians what they already possess, what they already have. And we're going out of darkness in the light. And out of darkness in the light is to recognize the great love that the Father and the Son have for each other. And now they are sharing that with us. In him. Now, in Christ, in him. We're going to start, we're going to see a whole series of in him statements. This is what we, the benefits we partake of when we are put inside the circle. In him we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. In him we have redemption. We are ransomed. Redemption is what took place when the sons of Israel were set free from slavery in Egypt and God bought them. God ransomed them. Remember, the blood of the Passover lamb was what ransomed them out of Egypt. While, while the firstborn of the Egyptians were perishing, all of God's people under the blood, the blood of the lamb on the doorpost were saved. And by the way, any Egyptian who put the blood of the lamb on their doorpost, or as often is the story, as the Egyptians were recognizing the angel of death going through, their city and their country and destroying the firstborn, they said, can we come into your uh, house that's under the blood here with our children and be protected? And the Jews said, come on in. See, that's a picture of mission. See, when the nations see God delivering his people, the nations turn to the Lord. That's a picture of, of, of our mission. So that's redemption, and that redemption is forgiveness of sins. Now, this is interesting. Verses 15 through 20, the, the language, the structure, the strophes of 15 through 20 make it look as if this is a Christian hymn. It reads like a hymn. It reads like a song. A, this is a first century worship song. Uh, Colossians 1, 15 through 20. Now, it doesn't perfectly follow the meter of it, uh, of what a song uh, would, would, would sound like, the flow, the cadence of the song. Although, if you remove certain elements from it, there is a song or the structure of a song here. What Paul is doing is taking a common worship song that the Colossians would have sung, probably Epaphras had taught them this song, and he, he's fitting in a few uh, biblical imagery to extol, to exalt the cosmic Christ. Now, the discussion has been about what the Father's done, and now we're going to exalt and extol the Son. This is a psalm and a section of what we would call high Christology. It means it exalts Jesus to a divine level. It's language that's only used to describe divinity. Jesus is not simply a good man and a prophet. He is God in the flesh. There's an exaltation to the divine. There's a cosmic dimension. And Christ, the work of Christ is initially tied in with the original creation of the earth. Now, As the Son of God, as the Son of Man, He is the Word. He is the Creator. He was there in Genesis 1 creating the universe. And He is there in A.D. 30 or A.D. 33, dying, being raised from the dead and ascending to heaven and being part of the new creation, the recreation of the earth. First creation, new creation, is really a renewed creation. It's restoring the creation to its original purpose for which God created man. Creation and new creation is really creation and recreation or renewal of creation. That's why that's the same way covenant works. Covenant with Abraham here, covenant with Moses, covenant with David, covenant with what we what we call the new covenant, it's covenant renewals. It's a recreation. Now, 
here's the, the hymn. The hymn looks like this. Verse 15 starts out with this image. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. The second stanza in the hymn would probably be verse 17. And he is before all things. The third stanza, if you will, the third verse of the song would be, and all things in him consist. They're held together. The fourth verse is 18, and he is the head of the body, the church, and the fifth verse would be, and he is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead. And so, that's probably the main structure of the song. And then Paul fills in some, some other details explaining the song, explaining the, the hymn. So, so the hymn, if we read it, it would look something like this. This is what they sung. Of course, they, they would, would have sung it in Greek. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. He is before all things. In him all things are held together. He is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead. And they would just sing that in worship. Remember, Paul starts out with, I give thanks. And he then tells them in verse 12 to give thanks. And this is a song. So he says, well, here, here's, here's a, a psalm of thanksgiving. Here's a worship song, a.k.a. first century in Colossae. Now, what's interesting if, if we've got the, the song correct, it's four images of who he is. He is the image of the invisible God. He is before all things. He is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning. And the central verse then, the center of the song, and remember, Hebrew poetry is chiastic. It, it follows a pattern, an A, B, C, B-A pattern, and the center of any chiastic pattern, whether it's a worship song or a prophetic utterance, states the purpose of the song or the prophecy. The purpose of this song, he is this, he is that, he is this, he is that. The purpose is found in the second part of verse 17. In him, all things are held together. In him, in Christ, when we step into the circle, we see the truth from being in Christ. That's hope. When we step into the circle, Christ begins to move through us in his power. That's faith. And when we step into the circle and we witness the Father, the Son, and the Spirit working with each other, we are inspired to do the works that the Father and the Son and the Spirit do for each other. And we begin to do acts for Christ, and that's love. See, the, the body of Christ right now is divided. You have the faith church, you have the love church, and you have the hope church. The hope church is a, is a word church, a and, and by a word church, not just scripture, but they see clearly what the purposes of the Lord are because they're so rooted in the word and they prophesy and proclaim and teach correctly. We need the hope church in this hour. Now the faith church, on the other hand, I, I just, I, I had a, a discussion with a brother who was 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 in Alberta, Canada recently and just had a supernatural, powerful experience with the Lord. And the way that this brother described it is he said he became one, completely one with Christ. Now, he was looking at it from the standpoint of being empowered by the Lord. He was one with Christ. There was healing supernatural signs and wonders that took place because of being one with Christ. He was empowered. 
He was being empowered because Christ was moving through him. See, that's the faith churches. They, they have such a oneness with Christ that Christ's power manifests itself through them. We need faith churches in this hour. And then you see churches, and I love to talk about the CCDA, the Christian Community Development Association churches that are doing the work of the Lord on the ground. They are ministering acts of kindness, acts of love, acts of faithfulness, acts of truth. They, they minister to the poor. They minister to the broken. They are the love churches, and they are desperately needed in the church. We need love churches. Faith churches, where Christ is moving through them, Hope churches, where they stand in the midst of the hopes of the gospel and see truth so clearly, and love churches that do the works of Jesus and so proclaim the gospel and bring people to Christ. But here's the thing right now. The faith churches are divided from everybody because Everybody doesn't have the faith they have. The hope churches are saying, you guys are nuts. You're not seeing the truth. You're seeing fantasy. You're embracing false prophecy. You're em embracing false teaching. And the love churches are doing the works of the Lord in a concrete, visible, tangible way and saying, why isn't everybody else joining with us? See, the body of Christ right now is divided based on truth because of sectarianism, because we have not understood that all things are held together in Christ. When we all get inside the circle, he holds together faith, hope, and love. The faith churches are power churches, the, the hope churches are truth churches, and the love churches are justice churches. So if we want to modernize, we need truth, and power, and justice. But see, Christ holds them all together. He is the image of the invisible God, verse 15, the firstborn over all creation, because in him were created all things in the heavens and the ones on the earth, the visible and the invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. See, in him all things were created. And then it says, and all things were through him have been created and for him have been created. In him, through him, for him. Faith, hope, and love. And he holds all of these things together. And he is before all things. He is first. He is preeminent. He is Lord. He was there for the first creation and his lordship is established in the new creation. He was God of the first creation. All things came into being through the spoken word of the Father, and Jesus is the spoken word, and all things came into existence by that word, John chapter 1, the gospel. But all things are in him, through him, and for him. And God help us, but we need a church that moves in, through, and for him. We need a church that embraces all the attributes of the Son. Truth, power, justice, faith, hope, and love. We need them all. And right now, can you believe the church? See, this is the, 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 the genius of the deception that is at work in the body of Christ right now. We're fighting over truth. The power brethren are fighting with the love brethren and the truth brethren are fighting with the power and the love brethren. Why? Because what I see is the truth. Well, of course it is. It, what you see is the truth. And what you're doing is the truth. And the supernatural anointing and power that's flowing through you is the truth. And the devil says, ha, 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 a house divided shall not stand. He quotes Jesus to us and we don't listen. All things were created in him, through him, and for him. Verse 17, and he is before all things, and in him 
all things, what they don't splinter and separate and be divided. They're held together. Jesus, please hold your church together in faith, hope, and love. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have the preeminence. See, when Jesus holds all things together in himself, what the result is, The result is a new creation. See, we're talking about the former creation. Jesus created the powers, the principalities, the throne, the cosmos, the the earth, everything in the earth. Jesus did that. But in the recreation, in the new creation, when he came to earth as the Son of Man, what did he create? A body in which all things are held together. And see, we're the body, church. The body that was broken on the tree and the blood that was shed on the tree for our justification and our salvation, that body now is, it birthed the church. He went to heaven, was established as king, and he sent the Holy Spirit. And what happened when the Holy Spirit came? We became the body of Christ. See, heaven and earth, the purposes of heaven come to earth. God becomes man, and when the God-man goes back to heaven, human beings now become the representatives of God on the earth in the body. And the reality of the body is that all things are held together. Because in him, again here, and this, this is the, the, the power of what's in Christ. In him was pleased to dwell all the fullness of, All the fullness, and the fullness is everything that God is. Complete divinity. Complete divinity. Later on it will be said, he is the fullness of the Godhead in a bodily form. The fullness is everything that God, the Father, God, the Son, and God, the Spirit, is, was deposited in the God-man. And so when Jesus came, so to come into Christ, When we step inside the circle, we can experience the fullness of who the Father is, the fullness of the Son, the fullness of the Spirit through the Son, because the fullness is in Him bodily. And remember, fullness can also, the same word for fullness can mean to be filled. When we're filled, we're filled with the fullness. When we're filled with the Spirit, we're filled with the fullness of God. When we are praying for the fullness of divine revelation, we're speaking of the revelation of Jesus Christ. Now, verse 19, for it pleased the Father that in him all the fullness should dwell, and we'll close up here, we'll finish up with verse 23, and through him, through this Jesus who holds everything together and and establishes these purposes for his church to continue his work, and through him to reconcile all things unto himself. So in him is the fullness. Through him, all things then are reconciled to God. Reconciled means we go back to the original purposes that the Lord established for the creation in Genesis 1. Through him to reconcile all things for him is what it says. So in him, the fullness of the Godhead causes a reconciliation between creator and creation broken by sin through him and it's ultimately for him so that we might walk worthy and be pleasing to him in all things. And this reconciliation is marked with having made peace through the blood of his cross through him again This reconciliation takes place through him. The blood of the cross says we are brought into Christ and we can participate in the relationship that the Father, the Son, and the Spirit have with each other. And all of that was sealed by the resurrection. Through him, whether the things on earth or the things in the heavenly places, the heavens and the earth come together. And he closes, and you who were once alienated and enemies in your mind 
by wicked deeds. See, outside of Christ, there's hostility toward God, hostility toward human beings. Outside of Christ, there's no reconciliation between God and man and between man and man. Outside of Christ, our minds are immersed in the deception that produces deeds of wickedness in our lives. And deeds of wickedness are simply deeds that hinder the grace and the shalom and the steadfast love and the faithfulness of the Lord from being manifest in the earth. Remember we said we'd, we'd see this word now over and over again. I, I haven't emphasized it, but here's one. And you who were once alienated and enemies in your mind by deeds of wickedness, now he has reconciled. He takes us out of Christ and puts us in Christ. And he's reconciled us in the body of his flesh through his death. It's his death and resurrection that now changes the whole way the universe runs. We can now come back into Christ be reconciled to the Father, the Son, through the Spirit. And he did all this to present us holy, without blemish, without fault, in his presence. Now the term to present something in the Old Testament, a person who was made whole and made righteous would present himself to the Lord or would present an offering to the Lord so that he could be made righteous. In this picture, Jesus presents himself and we're the offering. We are the offering and we are reconciled to God and because we're put in Christ now and we participate in all the blessings, all the power, all the goodness of the Father, we are presented as holy, that means set apart for the work of the Lord. We are set apart without blemish because his righteousness is ours and we are without fault before the throne. Now there's a, there's a, a, a unification of, of different trajectories there. Uh, there's a liturgical, a theological, and a, a, an ethical dimension there. And they all come together in Christ. The theological is that Jesus presents us to the Father. The liturgical is that we are seen by God. Without blemish, you could, you had a, the the sacrifice the sacrificial lamb offered to the Lord had to be without spot or blemish. It had to be a a perfect lamb, and that's that's liturgical on the basis of what Jesus has done, because we're in the circle now. We partake in His righteousness, but without fault is an ethical term. We're being moved. the The full purpose of the Lord is not just to say. I impute righteousness to you. He imparts righteousness and we begin to live an ethical, moral, and righteous life. If indeed you continue in the faith, having been placed on a firm foundation and not drifting away from the hope of the gospel. A couple images there. To continue in faith means that we are placed on a firm foundation. The same word for being placed on a firm foundation here in Colossians goes back to Matthew 7 where Jesus said, those who hear my word and do it, that's what it means to continue to walk in faith. We hear it and we live as if it's true. That's what it means to do the work of the Lord. We enter into this circle where we see things the way we are, where Christ's power moves through us and we do the works of the Lord. If you continue on, it says, the person who hears my word and does it will be like one who built his house on rock. And when the winds and the storm came, that house could not be moved because it was built on a firm foundation. The foundation is back in John chapter 5. He who hears my word and believes it. And he, he concludes with, and not drifting away from the hope of the gospel. We started in the hope of the gospel. We're here in the hope of the gospel. And it's interesting, not to drift away means to shift away. And it was a word that was used for when the ground shifts in an earthquake. And the interesting thing is Colossae, the city, 
was in the Laika Valley and they experienced earthquakes. No earthquakes, no storms, no earthquakes can move us from the foundation when we hear his word and believe it. And not drift away from the hope of the gospel which you heard, which was proclaimed in all creation under heaven, of which I, Paul, became a servant. Not a CEO, not a president, but a servant. Father, this is the prophetic significance of the, re- uh, of, of the resurrection, Lord. We thank you for it this day, Father. May your church continue to recognize We need to step into Christ and see and evaluate reality. We need to step into Christ and he will move in power through us. And we need to step in Christ and we can see the deeds of the Father, the Son, and the Spirit and begin to do that to our fellow human beings and invite them to come in where the blood of the Lamb pass over. The Passover Lamb's blood is on the doorpost and they too shall be spared from the destruction of this worldly system. In Jesus' name we pray it. Amen. Happy Resurrection Day, brothers and sisters in Christ.